The webinar is now broadcasting to all attendees. Good stuff. I really hope nobody's getting a notification on that. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Did you get a notification? Good link. Uh, business uh, based in southeast London and we are both architects that, that run the practice so it's my wife and I uh, and we do a mixture of residential and kind of, uh, development residential projects across the UK so we work as far as Leicester and um, I tend to work more afield on the, the development stuff and then do lots of residential stuff uh, in and around London and kind of the southeast uh, so that's where we the kind of stuff that we tend to do. Brilliant. Thank you and welcome and thank you for joining today, Nicholas. I appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having us. And Nick from New Projects in Fulham. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Um, could you maybe uh, just introduce yourself as well? Why should we listen to you? Why? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> So my name is Nick Jeffries of New Projects of Fulham and we are a uh, luxury design and build construction company which specialises in architecture, interior design, project management and construction. So we offer clients turnkey solutions in West London for their construction projects. Sounds good. Glad to have you on board as well. Um, and myself, I am uh, Frederick Gatting. I am the, uh, the manager of Vario by Velux, which is the Velux Group's first ever bespoke product solution. Um, I've been born and raised in the building industry. I've been selling blinds uh, in the Baltics. I've been uh, working with builders, merchants, and homeowners and architects uh, across Europe for my entire career. Uh, and last year, I uh, was part of the team who started Barrio by Vilox. Um, so that's my background. And um, the reason we are here today is uh, in order to have our first webinar, which is called the um, Building and Renovating for Healthy Homes. Uh, and the first topic we've chosen to take up is how do you get your extension project off the ground? Um, we know that extension projects um, and home renovation um, and new builds are interesting topics for our customers, especially extensions as these are a typical way of extending your, ho uh, your home uh, and a uh, common uh, project for customers. We know that there are millions of extensions in the UK um, as it often proves more economically viable to build an extension compared to moving to a bigger property uh, due to the stamp duty fees, um, due to real estate agent fees, etc. Then it can be a really good decision to extend your home. Um, we also do know that a lot of these extensions uh, are built in uh, or built without um, roof lights and therefore some of them tend to be a bit too dark. Um, that's the, the topic of today. How do you go about building your own extension project or how do you go about getting started and getting it off the ground? Uh, the content of today will be a bit about healthy homes. Uh, what is a healthy home and why is it important to us? Then we'll deep dive into four highlights of an extension project. Um, and thirdly, we will dive into a panel discussion um, regarding traditional versus design and build contracting. The reason we have uh, Nicholas and Nick today uh, is that they in principle represent uh, each of these uh, types of contracting. Um, Nicholas as the architect, uh, tend to represent the traditional contracting, um, which is architect-led, whereas um, Nick from New Projects is more of a design and build 
company and thus also design and build contracting. And lastly, we will wrap up um, and provide you with the key takeaways. And then we'll have a 15 minute Q&A session where you're free to post all your questions that you didn't get answers to. Um, we will try to answer as many questions uh, during the webinar. You're free to post uh, questions in the Q&A session. The more questions you post, the more value we'll get out of the webinar because without a doubt, the three of us can speak for an hour um, about a lot of stuff. But what really adds value is when we try to answer some of the burning questions that you might have. Um, the webinar will be recorded uh, and it will be available as a download after uh, the webinar has finished. I think that's, uh, that's it. So welcome, all of you. Today we have uh, these two guests, uh, Nicholas and Nick. And I thought it's, I think it's really important that we, we bring in both, of course, the, uh, the knowledge that we have in the VLOX group as a well-founded um, manufacturer, uh, but certainly also get the perspectives from two of the industry experts that we have in our wide network. So that's the reason why we have brought in Nick and Nicholas today. A bit on healthy homes. Today, people spend on average 90% of their time indoors. Um, and this is despite Corona or uh, in, in normal conditions, we spend on average two and a half hours outside um, during a full day. That's not a lot, um, we, we can see that. And that calls for the time we spend indoors uh, needs to be in well-lit, uh, well-ventilated and comfortable spaces. What's even more uh, important is to notice that of those 90% of the time we spend indoors, two thirds of that time we spend in our homes. Uh, we also go to work in offices, uh, but two thirds of the time we spend indoors are spent in our home. And that calls for creating healthy and comfortable homes for the occupants. That's something which is really dear to the VLOX group. That is why our overall uh, webinar concept is also called Building and Renovating for Healthy Homes. So with that intro, um, let's jump into highlights of the extension project. The first highlight we've uh, chosen to, to bring today is the concept of inspiration. And by the concept of inspiration, I mean the process of being mentally stimulated to do something creative. We can get these uh, inspiration points from various sources uh, and we should continue to get these throughout uh, any kind of project we uh, set ourselves to do. Um, but I would, I would actually like to, uh, to ask maybe Nicholas, this inspiration phase, the early phase of any uh, kind of project, but in particular an extension project, how do you go about um, explaining or nudging your clients to, to uh, have a good, first inspiration phase so i think basically the uh, the early stage is maybe more than than any other stage is supposed to be a really enjoyable one and i think that's something that's, that's uh, well worth remembering is that, that this is the stage that's full of ideas and uh, you know it's a time to be exciting and to, to explore some some different ideas and different concepts so uh, there's of course the the kind of some of the obvious ones that are on here you know exploring social media and you know, perusing the internet to see what you guys can find uh, and what just gets you excited and what works for you. Um, there are some other ways though as well as is looking at some more local and very specific examples. So if you know anybody in the local area or anybody with a kind of a similar house type to you that maybe has done a, an extension recently. Uh, and if you don't know anybody like that, then you can always do a little bit of sneaking around on Rightmove or something like that to look at houses on the kind of immediate few streets around you that 
can show you what uh, houses that have been fully done up and might be being sold for are. Um, so those are good ways and, and basically just getting out there, talking to people and where possible, I think we, we maybe touched on this a bit later on, but trying to play to your strengths. You know, if images are the things that really work for you, use images, go and find lots of social media pictures. If, if you know, you need to get out there and experience those spaces, then try and find people that you know and talk to them about the process and ask them about what was good and what was bad and what worked and what didn't um, and just try and enjoy it. Uh, and then work together to, to try and get something with a, with a designer as well. One of, one of the questions from, from my side uh, when we've been discussing has been, do you need a professional to guide you in this inspiration phase? Or is it something that you can undertake yourself, um, either through social media or talking to the moms at school or friends and family who've done a similar project? How, how would you go about that? So to be honest, the, the two things need to go a little bit in tandem. Um, do you need a professional involved to, to, to find lots of really exciting images and to get uh, you know, interested in what you're doing? Definitely not. You know, obviously nope. you go out and scour and, and look at whatever you want and um, uh, those sorts of things. I'd suggest that one of the important things about getting a professional involved in is that they can start to talk to you about what might be feasible. Uh, and those are some of the things that maybe need to go in tandem with with the, what's exciting. And uh, so I think it's a great idea to have a list of of pictures or maybe a written brief about the types of spaces that you're trying to create or the reason for why you're trying to do the things. Uh, have that early on and, and have that ready for the discussion. But actually, you know, you might be thinking, well, I'd love to do a two story rear extension and I'd love to get, you know, an absolutely or, or a huge uh, rear extension that goes out the back of kind of three or four meters but if you find out a little bit later down the line after having spent lots of time that maybe that's not feasible in planning terms for whatever reason then you know you have to kind of come backwards one step so it can just be worth making sure that you go through the different the different steps step by step making sure that what you want is feasible is going to come in budget and those types of things so i think that's one of the benefits of having somebody a professional designer builder a, you know a, whatever that might be involved at an earlier stage to just help you along those those kind of checkpoints i think it's it's, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, the the design brief or uh, the the input for any kind of professional what would you what would you recommend um, is included in a brief if you if you were to structure your thoughts about how how should i go about this inspiration phase what are the elements that should be included in a brief like this? So the, to be fair, the place that we start with on that is, uh, as I said before, the important thing to start with is play to your strengths. If writing a brief is the kind of thing that, that, that you know, trying to get your ideas down on paper in a written form, uh, if that helps you out, then, then great, go for it. And if doing it with, with photos or, or whatever like that might, might be better for you, then that's a great place to start. But, when you get a professional involved, they'll probably try and work on a brief with you. Um, so that's something that they will be putting together with you. So don't feel like you, that is something that you need to do before that conversation. Um, but if you are going to put that together, then I would basically be thinking about why or what the spaces are that you're trying to add, you know, what the reasons are for what you're trying to, to add into it. Is it to get a bigger kitchen because actually you love entertaining and you love uh, you want to, you know, you're the chef and you want to be in the kitchen at the same time and have that big dining table there and be able to talk to people. Is it actually that you want to have a better connection to the gardens for your, for your living space? So you're not getting enough sunlight, you know, in the room at the front is the whole thing too disconnected and you're not getting to see your kids enough. Are you getting to see your kids too much? And actually it would be great if you could have them, <laughs> you could them away in at the front. There are lots of different things. Sometimes we even start with a place where they think, well, actually, I really want to, to extend out the back because I need this extra space. But sometimes you actually end up a few months down the line saying, actually, it sounds like what you need is, is extra bedroom space at the moment as first step. And second step could be trying to get that, that extra bit at the back. So have a think okay. about what the reasons behind it are, I guess. Yeah. And I find in the beginning, there's all kinds of confusion as well. You know, everyone's dreams and aspirations and their ideal layouts possibly aren't even achievable. And so, you know, with us, we always offer our clients maybe a free session with an architect to get, come up with some concept design ideas. Just to make sure we're all clear from the start, you know, without any costs occurring that 
this can be achieved, you know, and the, uh, maybe we'll make some inquiries of what's being approved in local areas. You know, has anyone created um, that loft conversion with a load of glazing on very cool, couple of, you know, a contemporary design before? Um, is that kitchen side return? Uh, as Nick has said, you know, will they uh, pass a six metre uh, kitchen side return with a, um, um, a you know, a, a solid glazing roof? You know, these are all questions we need to be answered quite quickly because otherwise you could end up uh, spending an awful lot of time um, finding these things out later on. And we've, all, we've also had clients as well come to us and they've done their drawing applications themselves. Disaster, you know, and this, all this does this cost the client more money down the line because if the drawing, if the planning drawings have been approved, which the clients have done, but then when it comes to the building regulation drawings don't match up the structural drawings, then this causes problems and they've got to be redone again. What would what would then be your recommendation, Nick? That to either the to client, bring in a professional. 100% from the yeah. start. You know, yeah. I've an architect like Nicholas or a design and build company like ourselves. Okay. Um, okay, it's a, it's a good, good uh, discussion. I think um, what I would be wary about um, as a, a client is how far do I go uh, in, in terms of setting myself uh, oh, um, relying on one relationship uh, at an early stage, would you would you be able to? Uh, I know that there's something called an architectural appraisal or sketches or kind of a, a preliminary uh, sketch up of what could be done, both within building regulations, potentially also within planning permission, etc. We'll get to that at a later stage. But is there a a way to go about onboarding a professional in a cost effective manner? at the early stage? Well, if, you know, you know, the average person is definitely gonna go and get multiple quotes for maybe an architect or a construction company. So, what, why we are so different, you know, it's all about brand awareness and building that relationship up even before they call you. So they may have seen our branding all over the place in West London. They may have seen my face on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, wherever. So that relationship is already there. So like this morning, I went to see the client and they want us to refurb their flat in Chelsea. Um, they're not going to be looking anywhere else. They've seen me talking. They know what I sound like. They've seen me present online. Um, they like the brand. They feel safe in what we're offering. So it makes life a lot easier. But if, if it's a complete cold call and it's a new inquiry, no one knows who you are, then you know, a client is definitely going to go get two or three or four estimates from different companies. And especially if, it, if they're going directly to Nicholas for, for an architecture or, or myself, you can't keep giving things away for free. You need to make sure there's a good chance you're going to be winning the job. Because obviously time is money. If, if Nick or myself is going to spend half a day creating some concept design drawings for a kitchen side return, we want to make sure we have a good chance of winning the job. Yeah. Like going to tenders, like Nicholas, if he's coming, you know, he's a standalone architect, but if he needs a builder to build out one of his project, projects, he's going to come to me and two or three other contractors because his client is going to want the best price possible. And then it's up to me to pitch to Nicholas that we are, you know, the best thing since size bread. The, this, is, this is what it's going to come in at. This is the time scales it's going to come in at. And um, why look anywhere else? And then once it passes Nicholas's uh, due diligence, then I'll be probably introduced to the client and I have to do the same again with the client. So there's lots of hurdles to overcome. And, um, you know, I don't know what Nick thinks about that. I think there's there's kind of two parts to the the question as I see it there. So so one part is looking at um, the relationship and picking an architect or or a designer or a builder, and then the other part is is how do I know that this 
personal, the, the design, the concept that I've got in my head is, is going to be feasible. You know, how do I, do I work that out at an early stage without having to appoint yes. somebody and having, having spent lots and lots of, of money down this, this kind of journey. Um, so if, if I split those two different thing, things out there, um, with, if we approach how do, how do we know what we, that what we want to do is going to be feasible and how do we get to that point um, before we spend too much money? So yes, firstly, you can ask uh, you know, an architect, a designer, a, a contractor or, or whoever it may be that you're approaching. You can often ask them to do small feasibility studies to look into options for you. So we're putting one together for, for somebody at the moment who they've got a property and there are loads of different things that they can do with it. And they're considering that the property is on a big slope. So they're considering, do they do a basement dig or do they do a rear extension or do they do a dormer or do they do bits of the others? So, so we sketched out some basic options for them and then you can kind of put basic costs together for them. And we also run due diligence against planning for them. And that all comes as a very small kind of quick pack to get ideas together and see what might work for them. So right. of course you can okay. ask them to approach that type of thing. Would that be free of charge? Would, you, would that be a free? So no, so um, a feasibility study like that, where we're looking at costing and we're doing proper design options, no, that wouldn't be free of charge. It just is charged at a, let's say, reduced rate. It just is charged at a time kind of cost for those yeah. things. But what we would do for every project that comes in, so, so whenever somebody comes to us, first of all, with an idea, the first thing that we will do is talk to them. So we either talk to them face to face or we'll talk to them over the phone and go through kind of like what we just talked about, what their brief is. So we will try and establish a brief for them. We will, of course, get the, the full address and everything from them so we can look up the details on both Google Maps so that we can see what the property looks like. Um, we will then tend to look and do a full due diligence planning set of research as well. So when we present our quote, our quote tends to come with um, three or four pages. Or we'll have a, the first page will be a written brief, and then the next few pages will be a full due diligence planning check. So what we're doing at this point is we always, before we quote, or rather as we quote, so when we send the quotes over, we already know whether or not we can get planning permission for what they want, or if we don't think we necessarily can, whether we think you know, what the risk level is. So sometimes we will just write back and say, look, specifically what you want isn't possible, or we don't think it's very possible, it's very unlikely, but we can do this, this, or this, and then we could talk about what the prices for those may be. Uh, but we would want to have a very clear idea of what's going to be possible in planning terms way before we, we start or get appointed or get paid anything for a project. So um, that's an important thing to, to think about on that. Um, and would you like me to talk a bit about picking a, a professional or, or anything like that? Or um, No, I think we'll get to that. I think this was, uh, it was uh, at, at least clarifying for me. Uh, I hope it was for, for our participants as well. So thank you for that, both of you. Um, if we move on to, to the next element, which is the concept of design. When I say concept of design, um, I coined it as a plan or drawing made to show the look and function of a building before it's made. Um, and here, there are a lot of elements to consider, I'm sure. Um, here, it, to me, at least, it, it begins to move into where you would like a professional uh, involved. You've moved beyond the, the super dreamy phase where you get a lot of inputs from various places, um, both uh, friends and family and uh, certainly also social media with mood boards and pictures uh, and materials. And here you move into something more. Um, I would... I've highlighted both the look and function um, because of design is, is often um, seen as choice of material, um, choice of fittings, um, choice of, uh, of what is visible. Um, but there's, there's also an important element to the design, which is the function. How do I, how do I either link the space to the existing building? How do I ensure that we won't create a new favorite space and then let the, the existing building die off or similar? Um, I would like to hear a couple of words from, from you, Nick, and your projects on, on how you go about combining these, um, these elements in the design phase, both the look and function when meeting clients. 
Um, what we tend to do when I when I when we meet the client for the first time and um, we build that rapport and um, we get to know about each other's sort of they, I get to know about them what they their needs are and the requirements are and um, we tend to talk about the concept design phase and the ways we can achieve what they really want want to achieve. Um, I will bring in one of my uh, architects. So we've got uh, an interior designer and a architect who work in-house for new projects. And basically they would go through different stages and um, processes to, uh, to eliminate what's not possible and what is possible. And um, so from start to finish, you know, we try and make sure, you know, the whole design phase is monitored and, um, you know, the customer gets exactly what they want, basically. All right. And Nicholas, you, you are a form and function guy, I assume, as, uh, as an architect. Um, this, this design phase is of utmost importance to you or, or what? Yeah, I, I mean, this is obviously one of the, the key uh, phases and one of the ones that we will almost always be involved with. Uh, I mean, sometimes you'll get brought on just to do the, the construction phases and to help manage people at later stages, but most of the time people are getting us involved at the early stages to help out with this type of stuff. And, um, so, you know, how do we approach this type of thing? I, I think generally um, it will vary from project to project and it really will vary depending on what the brief is because um, if the, the clients are coming to you and saying, what I really want is an absolute showstopper of a, of a thing and it, I want to have something that's going to be featured in magazines and I want it to be completely unique and it's going to be different and budget isn't an option and um, let's just throw money at it and let's go, then we would approach that from a very different way from somebody saying, look, we've just had a new family, money's uh, a factor and we need to <laughs> the base. I'm, I'm assuming here, but, but most clients would probably be in the, in the B section. Is that is that correct or what? Uh, more, I think more, more often than not in the country, it would be. I think um, so. In my certainly uh, my background, a lot of projects I used to deal with. So my background used to be kind of super prime and, and high end resi in prime London, um, and so you did get used to asked to do lots of different things. But but maybe I was exaggerating to a point that there are certainly certainly different things are important to different people. I suppose is, is the um, is the, the takeaway from that. And so there's some people, and I, I think it, this thing should really be client driven. I, I'm, I tend to be very, very practical when I approach things. And so I want things to work and to function properly as a space. So for me personally, that's often be, is where I tend to approach this stuff from. I want to know that all of the spaces are going to work for you and a family. I want to know how the family or the people that are going to be using this house are going to live their daily lives and make sure that we haven't wasted any space. Um, that's how I like to approach things because I'm quite pragmatic in that kind of that kind of sense. But as I said, sometimes people come to you and just say, "Look, I want something. I want you to be brave, and I want you to do something interesting." And maybe with that, you start from a different vantage when you're when you're approaching the design phase of this. So it can really depend, and I think it should be driven by the client. All right. And um, in the design phase, you you probably often run into uh, to the budget question uh, and also the feasibility question. The feasibility question uh, revolves, to some extent at least, um, around planning. Um, we've, uh, we've, I'm a bit puzzled uh, myself about uh, permitted uh, developments, planning permissions, and prior approvals uh, sent to, uh, to the, the council uh, for approval when you build something new. This is not completely black and white. Uh, and I am sure that just like me, uh, a lot of our participants uh, during today's webinar would like to get a bit of clarity on, on how does it work with, uh, with permitted developments, uh, both in London uh, and outside of London, probably, um, and also planning permission. Uh, so, if we start with permitted developments, um, Nick, how how do you uh, do you do you see permitted developments um, 
in London and other places than London? For us in Fulham, we don't really come up with many permitted development projects because most of our uh, uh, projects in sort of Fulham, Chelsea, South Kensington, you know, uh, Mayfair are in conservation areas. So permitted development would be, you know, it's just, I, to be fair, we, I think with a permitted development project, the last one we did was about four years ago uh, on a kitchen extension. Uh, most of our projects are uh, large kitchen extensions, loft conversions, pod rooms, mansards, and even basements. So permitted development for us really doesn't come into it. Uh, planning permission does. So most of our projects would go through the planning process, i.e., you know, uh, pl uh, planning uh, takes you know uh, 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 eight weeks to get the planning pro planning through, and then um, we would go straight into building control drawings, and then work on the um, party wall agreements, and then we can start the, the build. Okay, and um, permitted development rules, um, Nicholas. There are some th rules of thumb in terms of uh, permitted developments because the permitted development um, rights have been developed in order for, for people to build um, more um, and people to be able to build at a faster pace without uh, having to go through the, the councils, right? Could you say a couple of words on permitted development, um, Nicholas, maybe? Yeah, of course. I, I think the thing to understand uh, is that there's no easy answers here. Um, there, it's worth approaching uh, each project with its own in its own light. Um, so, as Nick has said, there generally, if you live in a conservation area, or if you have a listed building, or in other certain areas. So, if you live in other parts of the country, so areas of special scientific interest or areas of natural beauty, for instance, generally will have what's known as an Article Four direction on them which means that you don't get permitted development rights. So sometimes you don't have any permitted development rights. Um, sometimes within those areas though, you might have some of your, still have some of your permitted development rights. So you can be in a conservation area and still have some permitted development rights, um, which is where it starts to get really complicated because sometimes they take some of them away, but let you have others. So it's a very conservation area specific um, set of regulations. Um, if you do have permitted development rights in your, at your property, uh, the important thing to know about it is basically that it is, what, what the government has done is given blanket planning permission for a bunch of what they would call typical works uh, to be able to go ahead without you needing to, to ask their permission for this stuff. So essentially, we all already have planning permission. I, I live in a house that is not in a conservation area. I have permitted development rights. Therefore, I have planning permission from the government to do a bunch of works that come within that umbrella. Um, beyond that, so the, the basic things that I can do are, I can, uh, so the, the things that are important here are whether or not you're in a terrace property or a, or a uh, detached property is, is the two main things. Um, if you are, because the, the amounts that you can build tend to just slightly vary there. So if you're in a terraced property, uh, you can do a dormer conversion um, uh, or if you're in a detached property, you can do a dormer conversion, but the actual volume of size that you can add on to the rear dormer changes with, with what you're trying to do there. And the same with the rear extension, you have the permission to be able to do a rear extension. If you're in a terrace or a semi-detached, you can go three meters back from the original line of the house as built in something like the 1920s or when it was originally built. Um, and if you're in a detached property, you can go back four meters. Um, there are then further caveats to this whole type of thing because you can also go back six meters or eight meters, so double, but for the respective house types, depending on, well, if you initially go to them before you're about to do it and, and ask for what's called a prior approval notice. So um, that's essentially asking to see whether or not any of your neighbors have any uh, objections to you doing this. And so it's mostly based on that. Um, so there are lots and lots of different things that you can do and lots of minor works that are also covered under this, like replacing of some windows or uh, putting roof lights on your front, uh, the, the front roof slope and things like that. So there's lots of things that's covered underneath, uh, under the whole umbrella of permitted development. And it's, you kind of need to do a mixture of knowing the permitted development rights and knowing what's appropriate for your property specifically. 
And is, is it easy for, for a homeowner to uh, find out whether you are capable of doing a permitted development uh, at your um, property or on your property? So the, the government has a, um, the, the simple answer is it's, it's easy enough. They, they write it in a bit of a, a complicated way. So there is a permitted development book for, for homeowners. Um, and and they, it's easy enough to kind of read through. Uh, they do a lot of, you do not have permission if you do do this kind of stuff. So there's a lot of negatives going in there that you have to check through and make sure that you tick off. But, but essentially it walks you through if you're doing a rear extension and it has little diagrams and shows you what you're doing. Yes. So, you know, you have permission or you, it will always say you do not have permission if, if you come under one of these things. But Nick, it still takes time, doesn't it? It still takes time to get the permitted development and do the drawings and then do the building control drawings. So there's still a hell of a lot of work architects have got to do to get it, get the thing built, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that, that people um, don't realise with this or, or think about it. Just to add one more thing, there's, a, there's an, on, the, on the website thing, there's another website that the government also run, I think it's on the planning portal, and they have like a 3D model interactive model that tells you yes or no in a much better way um kind of broad strokes what you can and can't do so you can kind of look for that online um yes you can include a link here yeah uh, yeah um yeah we, we can we can certainly find yeah. out where that is the uh the thing about community development is and, and this is why it's it's important to think about your strategy as a whole is that sometimes you can achieve more and or something under permitted development that you couldn't achieve under full planning uh, and that gets really confusing. So if we take the example of, um, I, I have a, a property that we're working on, which is in, an, a, it's in a really nice area and the house is beautiful. Planning permission, and it's in, a, in an area of, of uh, South London. And although it sh looks like it should be a conservation area, it's not. Planning permission says that they can only do uh, rear extensions that are appropriate to the size of the dwelling. It's a detached dwelling. And based on planning permission, they would only be able to go out about three meters, 3.6 meters, I think is the maximum they say that they can go out at the back of under planning permission, but they have full plan permitted development rights. So the client really, really wanted an, a, a massive extension on the back of it. And we got permission under um, prior approval through permitted development to do an eight meter rear extension at the back, full width across. So sometimes you can get a lot more by doing permitted development and, and things that wouldn't necessarily be achievable under full planning. So there are certain things like doing a hip to gable conversion that are achievable under permitted development that are not necessarily going to be achievable under planning. So yes, it still takes time. Um, with the basic stuff, so sorry, this is a really complicated thing, but, but with the basic stuff, so, so if I take the three meter rear extension, for instance, with a three meter rear extension, I, I just have permission to do that. I don't need to ask anybody about it or do anything. In theory, you could just start working on it tomorrow. And lots of people around the country will just start working on it. What people often want though, and one of the things that takes time is that you can get what's called a, um, a certificate of lawful development or certificate of lawfulness from the, uh, the, the, the council where basically you write to them and you say, hey guys, can you, can, just, can you just give me a written piece of paper, kind of like a planning approval that just says, yes, this is covered, this is a, a, a permitted development scheme. And the reason people like to have that is just the certainty that nobody's gonna come back at a later date and say, hey, that wasn't really a permitted development scheme and you should have had planning and now you're gonna to have to take it down. And mostly that's just done for a bit of peace of mind. And it's done, um, again, mostly because when people sell it, the, the solicitors often want to see that kind of proof. Um, so do you need it? No. Did most people get it? Yes. Like it, so I've only ever done one where we've, where the client has just gone, I don't care, I don't want the piece of paper, I'm just going to do it. Um, most people want to have that certificate. But it is a bit faster, both prior approval and certificate of lawfulness are a little bit faster than planning, but, but negligibly. Okay. Uh, they also okay. don't require quite as much information um, to, to submit as with them. But, but it's, again, it's pretty negligible. Okay. Good. Um, it's probably not clear to everybody, but uh, that's the nature of it, uh, it seems. Um, but hopefully that, that clarifies a bit, uh, at least in terms of um, the fact that you can, can often do or sometimes do more uh, on the permitted development uh, compared to 
having a planning permission. Um, I didn't know that, at least. Thank you for that. If we move on to, uh, to the concept of daylight and view, very often uh, when building extensions, um, we, we see rear extensions um, that are made as kitchens or great rooms. If we go back to the 90% of the time we spend indoors uh, and two thirds of that being spent in the home, um, the vast majority of that time spent in, in our home, we spend in either our kitchen or our great room, um, at least the, the awake hours where we meet with uh, friends and family, where we entertain, uh, and then where we are, are enjoying the company of others um, while not sleeping. Um, that calls for, for well-lit um, uh, rooms and also uh, rooms that are in connection with the outside. Very often these extensions are rear extensions going towards the garden, uh, creating a great view and connection to the outside. Um, how are you, um, Nick, uh, from New Projects, how are you considering um, daylight and view in, in your extension projects, both ongoing and historically? Well, um, at the moment we've got nine live projects in Fulham and Chelsea, all of which are including side returns, kitchen extensions, loft conversions and pot rooms. So one of the things the client always wants to talk about is bringing light into the building somehow. And they always mention the brand Velux for starters. They want Velux windows, they want glazing, they want skylights. And, um, you know, sometimes um, in a West London property, they want the side return to be, you know, like a solid side return with Velux windows. Maybe motorized to let some fresh air in um, with blinds. Or solid glass structural glass on the sides. I know you guys are getting into that now um, to let maximum side uh, uh, light into the kitchen. And, you know, we also build lots of basements out. So basements, we have walk on glass, structured walk on glass. So maybe the kitchen side return underneath the kitchen side return, we've got some more structural glass, which brings the light through the side of the building down into the basement. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, all of our projects, all of our clients, priority is bringing as much light in as possible. Some of our clients want something really contemporary. You know, we're doing a, we've got three loft conversions and pod rooms on the go at the moment. On average, they want standard loft conversions, uh, but we've got a couple at the moment. They want really uh, uh, high end, uh, contemporary, loads of glazing, lots of skylights. And, um, you know, it, it all depends on budget. You know, what do they want to spend? Where do they want to spend it? Do they want to spend it on the structure or do they want to spend it on the interior? Yeah. But to answer your point, you know, uh, by folding doors, side returns, skylights are all part of my day-to-day -day business within new projects. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, Nicholas, we're moving or, or building on that. Um, Nick mentions that it's every single time it's included in the project, um, but it all comes down to budget. Uh, what we tend to see sometimes, we know that 70% of uh, extensions do not include um, daylight through the roof, um, which of course to me is a pity, um, but maybe you can put a couple of words on, on why it is that, that that part of the building sometimes is deprioritized, the fifth wall or the, the ceiling, um, Nicholas. So yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with Nick actually that almost all of our projects have uh, daylighting coming in from from the top from the roof windows um, and one of it might be that we're slightly maybe biased because of, of doing a lot of projects in London so if we think about London and, and most of the UK we've got traditional terraced housing uh, so you're quite close to one another 
But once you do that, that very typical side infill uh, extension, basically you, you, the, the room that was previously, in most of these Victorian houses, you, you come in, you have the stairs in front of you, you've got those two rooms off to your right or left hand side. Um, the front one tends to be the living room and the back one traditionally was the dining room or, or you know, a second drawing room type thing. And that had some access to the garden and had a big window in it. And when you fill that whole area in, you don't actually get any light in that area there. If, you, if you've just got the big bifolds at one end of the house, you're not going to get any light into that dark bit there. Now, as a general rule of thumb, uh, horizontal lighting, so if you've got bifolds and things like that, and this is the calculations they use when they're calculating uh, light coming into office um, blocks and stuff like that, where you have very deep plans, uh, generally the light only comes in about six meters. So you can kind of pace that at home and say, look, even if I have a full wall of you know, wonderful bifold glazing here or sliding doors or, or whatever you're going for. Once you walk six meters back from there, you're gonna have a much, much darker space. And so actually that room that was a lovely, lovely room at the time and that you've now spent all this money connecting through maybe isn't gonna quite have the same feel. Now, this won't apply to everything um, because there'll be lots of people that you know, with detached properties that can have extra glazing and things like that. But as far as why the, the lighting from above is so important, in those situations, that's the only place, that's the only way that you can get light into those very deep circumstances or situations in the, in the property. Um, I think generally from, from other points of view, thinking about it in budget terms, we would often recommend to people uh, within reason, as in we will always try and design, and I'm sure most people, um, most good at least professionals will, will be designing your property uh, and your extension with your budget in mind. So. We're trying to hit around about that number, but often what we will try and do is say, look, okay, your, your, your rough budget is this. We say, we're gonna, we, we'd like to actually include in the pricing structure, all of those really exciting things that you're really keen on. You know, let's get the, the, the whole thing priced up. Let's have the really nice glazing at the front. Let's have the big roof light. You know, let's have that extra, that really nice hob and extractor combination that you guys have been wanting. Let's get it priced up and then once we've got all of those figures in there, if we realize at that point that we need to start trimming stuff down, it's a lot easier to decide how much you like something once you know how much it's going to cost or how important that might be to you. So at that point, you can do a bit of value engineering before you start on site. Um, so very much it's important to get these things agreed before you start building. Um, but that can be one way to kind of approach it, to, to, to look at that, what's going to work with your budget, get the actual figures in, and then take things from there. Uh, but what we Good. tend to do, you know, when I, as a designer build company, when I have the initial conversation with the clients and they're telling me their brief summary, I will ask the client, what is the budget? Because if they say they've got, especially, you know, in London, it's prices are different to around the country. Definitely. Everything's a lot more money in London to build. Trades charge more money. Everything's more money. So if someone says, I've got 20K to do a side return, that's not gonna happen. And so all this glazing goes out the window. If someone says to me, Nick, uh, like the average price for kitchen side return in Fulham today, kitchen, maybe three or four uh, uh, skylights, um, bifolding doors, it's like 70 to 100 grand job with a new kitchen, easily, minimum. So, uh, you know, it's for me as a designer build company and a, a business person, I need to know sh sooner rather than later what their budget is because then if they do say oh we've got 150 and then Nick's job and my job is a lot more easier because then you can design something absolutely special especially if they want something glass and contemporary and modern you know the budget there is there for you to do something outrageous and beautiful yeah and I think you, you really want to be concerned about working with anybody that's not talking to you about budget as well um, so I talked before about taking some projects over at construction and at, and at later stages, and I don't, we don't do this that often. The, the, the ones where that tends to happen, um, and we do have a fair few of those to say, I don't do it that often, because the bulk of stuff we would get and take people all the way through, but the ones that we do take over at later stages tend to be when they've hired some other architects, uh, designers, somebody that's come along and, and they haven't really ever talked to them about budget. They design them this crazy thing that shapes all over the place and that, Oh, it's the it's the projects of our dreams. Then they get it all costed up, and it comes in at two hundred and fifty thousand. And then you've got, neg you've got a negative on your hands, and you've got a very unhappy client because you've exactly. designed something, and they've never no one's ever mentioned budget. 
exactly and you know the architect or the designer then walks away having taken their you know maybe fifteen thousand pounds or something for, for designing this whole thing when the planning fees and actually you know the the, the, the client's in a position where well yeah i got my design and i got approval for it but it's not feasible and it's not sensible so you know, having a pragmatic approach to all of this stuff and, and really understanding uh, how all of these layers fit together, um, you know, budget, design, you know, what you guys are trying to achieve as a family, uh, resale value, you know, all of those things. Are important. Um, yeah, so they, just, they do need to be considered, as Nick says. They're really important, all, kind of almost all of them together. Um, all right. Okay, just uh, we need to move on. Um, but just a final comment on this one. A wise man once told me that uh, you never meet a client that regret, regret having had um, that extra uh, roof window or roof light included in the extension. But you from time to time do meet clients that would have loved to include it at the beginning. Uh, the last point on this uh, slide is also saying do not compromise on the essentials. Uh, by that, um, I mean, do not compromise on the fabric of the building. Do not compromise on the flooring, on the walls, on the windows, whether they are in the facade or in the roof, uh, or on the doors or etc. This soft furnishing um, you could compromise on uh, because these are easily easily replaced um, and can re be replaced throughout the, the lifetime of the building. Whereas these essentials uh, that make up the entire building, they are much more difficult to replace uh, at a later stage. Mm -hmm. That's it. Then we uh, actually that change. Goes, that goes hand in hand with there's a structure, the glazing, and most important, if you're going to do a kitchen in Cybertone, it's always the kitchen. Yeah. So, you know, not, no cutting corners on the glazing, the bifolding doors, and the kitchen. No. That's okay. true. One of the essentials as well. Everything else can be upgraded at a later date. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd really agree. Good. Then we uh, change scene a bit. To uh, it has been a good discussion up until now, and uh, let's continue it. But let's change scene and uh, touch upon the topic of traditional contracting versus design and build contracting. Traditional contracting is is uh, argued to be where you get an independent consultant. These uh, types of contracting uh, are architect-led. The architect will, will be part of the entire process, uh, usually, um, and will kind of hold the hand of the client throughout. Um, whereas the design and build contracting is a one-stop shop where you uh, get a turnkey solution. You have one point of contact. And Nick and Nicholas, you are in principle representing um, each of these uh, contractings. And these types of contracting, both traditional and design and build contracting, are the two most utilized types of contracting in residential um, builds um, in the UK. And that was why I would love to hear a bit more about what are the advantages uh, of one and the other and potential um, elements to be aware of in one and the other. Um, if I can ask you, uh, Nick, as a design and build company, if you were to mention some of the advantages of traditional contracting, what would you then highlight. So in principle, highlighting um, Nicholas architect-led uh, type of contracting. What is it that they can do really well? What? You're talking to me now, Nick. Yes, yes. <laughs> when, when I go and see a client for the first time, I'm there as one person offer them a complete turnkey solution for their problem. So the average person, when they call me, uh, it comes through, it could come through any sort of social media platform or the website. It could be a cold call, could be a recommendation, could be anything. Guaranteed, these people do not have planning approval or any idea of how to get uh, their project up and running. 
could be mum and dad in a house in Fulham. They, they've just bought it. They want it, in, they want to increase the square footage because they've got a baby on the way. Do they need a loft conversion, mansard, pod room, basement? Who knows when I first turn up? So when I go to them, uh, I'm going to offer them the complete turnkey package. So we can talk about the architecture, getting the, getting the thing through planning, the different stages, you know, planning, planning drawings, building control drawings. We then work on the uh, structural drawings, the party wall surveyors, because we need the party wall surveyors to get signed off. Then we would liaise with building control. So building control, so that all these aspects come under us. We will control everything because otherwise, if we don't do it, the client's got to do it. So that is the architecture. Then it's the design, the interior design. So when we sign up a, a, a client, I more than likely will give them a free interior design package worth whatever it may be. So this is offering the client more value. I'm going to give this client so much value uh, for uh, coming with new projects. So they'll be giving a, a free interior design package maybe to choose their floorings, accessories, kitchens, tiles, bathroom, sanitary wear, whatever. And also we offer project management. So architecture, interior design, project management. Every, every job needs a project manager because if it doesn't go to a design and build, um, some architects do offer a... Uh, uh, project management package. It tends to be a lot of money. It tends to be maybe eight or ten percent of the actual contract value. So if it's a hundred grand job, that's another ten grand, isn't it? Just for project management, where our project management is almost part of the construction package. So you know, architecture, interior design, project management, and construction. So every single thing from start to finish is taken care of by one brand, one company, and one team. That is the way we tackle things with our client. But if the client comes to me and they've got planning mm -hmm. approval and they've already got an architect, it's cool. We work with the architect. All right. Um, thank you for that, Nick. Um, I wasn't uh, being particularly clear. If you were to mention maybe one or two uh, good elements of traditional contracting with an architect, an architect-led uh, contracting, what would that be? When, when is it suitable to go for, for a project where, where Nick, Nicholas from RD will be uh, the one holding the client's hand? When is that a necessity? It doesn't have to be a necessity. Because no. someone's going to come, someone's going to, you know, a designer build company can always tackle all projects. But if, if I had a job come in and it was a very specialist build and it was right up Nicholas's street, he specializes in um, um, contemporary modern design and he was an expert in his field and the client really wanted something special, then I would say, hang on a sec, I'm going to pass it over to Nicholas to take care of because he is more geared up to working on this type of project than we are. Mm. So, you know, okay. Good. I think design and build and uh, traditional architecture, it just blends into one in some cases. You know, there's no, even if Nicholas designs the scheme and then he hands over to me to do the build, Nick can, Nicholas can stay on as you know as architects do throughout the build maybe maybe he is taking care of the valuations for the client who knows but you know for some so, or, or he may he may just do the the, the planning drawings and the building control drawings and the scope of works and that scope of works comes over to me and then his job may be finished maybe we carry it on from start to finish but yeah. if nick giving me a tender nicholas is then on board from start to finish, making sure our tender pack, we're working through the actual process from start to finish. And Nick would probably be looking after the contracts, you know, from, from, it, from, from the client's point of view. If, if um, Nicholas, if these two processes or two contracting types are blending, there's no uh, black and white, it is, um, as you've mentioned before, a spectrum, Nicholas, but what are then the differences in these two types of contracting? 
I think to to do that, you have to maybe if we if we separate them into a kind of a very black and white, um, you know, looking at either end of the spectrum to to look at that because yeah, as as you said, I, I have mentioned before that it, it is a it is a spectrum. So where the different companies will will feature along this whole thing. Uh, can end up being a little bit blurry. So the way that new projects uh, with, with Nick actually work is that um, really all that they're doing, they're offering very much the same services. They're just all doing it all in-house and under one package. And um, so the real difference between what we're looking at here is who's taking responsibility for the, you know, who's holding the client's hand at what point. Um, so the main difference with what we're talking about here uh, at this point is do you have an architect or actually it doesn't actually need to be an architect. It could be a designer. It can be an architectural technician. It can be lots of different people. Sometimes project managers do this role too. You have one person that is acts as an independent person outside of all of the other, um, the trades. So with that, I mean, outside of the structure engineer, outside of the party wall people, outside of the contractor, there's one person there that in theory knows what they're doing and they hold the client's hand all the way through um, or, or at least through as many of the different stages as they want them to. So what would the differences be there? Really, the later stages stay very much the same because by that point, you've got a contractor on board. At early stages, your architect rather than your design and build company is looking after the design. Again, because I said this is a spectrum, you can have architects that are fantastic at planning and really understand what they're doing there. You can have design and build companies that really know what they're doing with planning. You can have architects that have no idea but think that they do. You can have design and build companies that are also really not good at that type of stuff. It is a spectrum and it will be about the specific people that you're talking to. Um, as you then begin to move on, I think one of the, one of the main differences here, uh, and again, it, it's a spectrum, so this doesn't always apply, but when you have an architect or an independent person on board, you put that pricing uh, information together. So this is right in the middle of the boxes that we're looking at at the slides at the bottom. At pricing stage, we're drawing up all of the information to a more detailed level than the planning information. We're putting a pack together and then sending it out to a variety of contractors. So generally, we would do no more than three. As Nick has already said, it takes a lot of time for a contractor to price the works. And I don't like wasting anybody's time. Three is more than enough. Um, you get three prices back. And then, you know, from that point, you can choose based on the prices and the people that you meet who you might want to take that through with. But at the same time, you will, I know certain design and build companies that will say, look, because I handle the architecture as a separate package, you know, I charge you for that. Then when we get further down the line, you're welcome to go and ask other people for, for comparison quotes to make sure that we're on the level. So it, it is not black and white here. There's lots of different um, ways of approaching uh, all of these different elements based on who you get involved with. Um, the important thing is to just make sure that the person that you have holding your hand at each stage really knows what they're doing and is the right person um, for your budget and for the job. Um, so yeah. As, as and said, potentially also relationship wise, that it is a person that you trust and you believe that you can work together with because no building or no build is straightforward uh, from A to C. From, from there the will be stumbling blocks. Meeting, from the very first meeting with the client, that is that when that's that rapport starts then yeah. whether I'm selling just building works or are or the whole thing, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm just, I'm just pitching my, my company, my brand, myself and whatever I need to do to win that job, whether it comes with planning or it doesn't come with planning, whether it needs a structural engineer or doesn't need a structural engineer, where it comes from, from, from Nicholas, it doesn't matter. We're all working together anyway. You know, so cool. Yeah, Thank you. We, if we talk about that relationship. Sorry, Frederick. Um, I was just thinking that the relationship thing is, is really important because, again, it, it should be the client, sh in a way, should be the one dictating what type of relationship that they have. So you don't necessarily need to pick somebody because you think that they're your friend or because that they, they get you or because they're necessarily in similar situations to you. It is about picking uh, somebody who you feel can de deliver the specific thing that you want. Now, there, my uh, wife, she used to work for somebody that I won't name, but is a, um, a Reber award-winning architect who does fantastic designs. Now they go to him, not because he's a nice person, but because he does very stylized, very specific things. He will tell you what you're going to have. You don't really have the choice, 
but they are wonderful and they will probably win awards. Some people want that. Other yeah. people maybe want to have somebody that they feel understands their personal situation and you know, gets them. Other people want the security of saying, look, I don't want too many people to point fingers at along this process. I want like a whole, I just want one company that I can trust that has a great reputation out there, you know, that can hold my hand through this whole thing. So don't feel like you as a client need to be pushed one way or the other. It's about you. You guys pick the people that you think is right for you. And that's, that's the important bit. It's your relationship. Yeah. Okay. We, uh, we have a question um, regarding how to design small spaces. Um, do you have any uh, good inputs um, and also inspirational places, uh, websites or similar uh, on how to, how to go about designing smaller spaces? Uh, yeah, so, uh, if, if, I, if I jump in on, on that one first, I think the first place that I would go, if you're designing, if, if we're talking micro spaces here, if we're talking really small spaces here, um, the first place to start having a look at is all of the kind of South Asian uh, architecture that you get there because often they're really, really struggling for, for space. So we're thinking like places like Singapore and Hong Kong, Japan, uh, places where they have these tiny apartments and they do some really, really amazing things. Um, often with, so is there, I don't know if there's a specific website for that type of stuff, but I'd be looking through Pinterest and trying to use that as a, as a kind of a springboard to, to see what you can find. Um, generally with, uh, tiny like micro spaces it, it becomes more about the uh, finishes like the joinery and the furniture and the finishes become more important it becomes more important to integrate all of those things so that you get flexible spaces so uh, then then the actual fabric so the built fabric is not going to be as important you're only going to be putting a couple of walls in or a, or a wall in a window it becomes important to make useful interesting ones is, is how you integrate joinery and built-in furniture and things like that that's generally the, the better way to, to approach them you can get prefabricated pods as well can't you to fit inside spaces we were working on a scheme near Heathrow called a uh, micro living apartment block for key workers and that we all, all we were doing it was a permitted development site to change commercial into residential and we would get these micro pods which were from china and they would fit straight in there so yeah Good, thank you. Okay, we uh, are slowly wrapping up. We are uh, moving on to uh, the last slide, pretty much. Um, main takeaways, a healthy home is important. We spend a lot of time indoors um, and we spend most of that time in our homes. That calls for creating healthy homes that are comfortable to be in. Um, seek inspiration wherever. Uh, spend the time necessary to get the right inspiration inputs. Um, certainly spend time on social media. Uh, that's a readily available place to search. But do also go out and meet uh, people who have been or are in the same situation as you. Uh, meet your neighbor. Meet, uh, talk to uh, the moms at school or similar. And have a look around in the neighborhood. Um, consider form and function under the or during the design phase. Um, form uh, is certainly important and look, um, but also the function, how are you going to utilize that space and how is it going to suit uh, your needs and your family's uh, needs. Plan according to your needs. Uh, it's not black and white uh, with planning permission and permitted developments. Sometimes you can do even more under permitted developments than under planning permission. So discover what your needs are and then um, choose the right way for your project. Um, remember to have a symbiosis of daylight and view. Uh, very often uh, in terraced housing, um, you, will, you will be challenged by uh, getting sufficient light into the building, uh, even the large new extension or in particular the existing home if you do not consider the fifth wall um, the ceiling and lastly consider who is suitable for your project who would you like to work with what is it that you are trying to achieve when going for a um, type of contracting either architecture 
uh, architect-led uh, contracting or design and build contracting. Anything to add, uh, Nick and Nicholas, to that wrap up? Hmm. Have fun with it. Have bit, fun. Bit, <laughs> yes. Bit Certainly. I agree. Uh, have fun with it. It's it's um, it's often a daunting challenge to uh, to uh, kick off an extension project, um, but there are certainly a lot of really really fantastic elements to it. You will also be challenged from time to time, but um, once it's done and you've been through that hard work, sitting in your new home uh, and enjoying a nice dinner with family and friends will be amazing. Um, so certainly I agree. Yeah, and I mean, they, we have done a, a big building project on, on our own property. And, and yeah, and even as people that, are, that, that do the whole thing and live, eat and breathe this kind of stuff, you know, it, it, there are still bits. There will be different things for different people that, you know, will, will push your, your buttons a little bit. Um, but people often talk about the IKEA effect, you know, the fact that actually you end up loving your furniture yeah. so much more when you've had to put that bit of effort into to making it. Well, it, it applies 10 times over, um, you know, when you're talking about, uh, you know, a rear extension that you've, you've you know, or, or any kind of home improvement that you've put that bit of effort into and, and that bit of love and bit of thought into. So, yeah, uh, enjoy the bits that you can. Um, and uh, hopefully by the end of it, um, you know, you'll still want to live there. And, uh, uh, yeah, and, <laughs> but, and I, but I, then again, I think this is where the, who you choose is key. Whether it's going to be a design and build company or you're going to manage the whole thing yourself individually. So a design and build obviously is going to take all the pain out, all the stress, all the worries. All you've got to do is pay the, pay the design and build when, you know, through the, through the, throughout the process on the, the cash flow. Uh, with the architect or the structural engineer or the party wall surveyors or the building control or whatever else comes into play, you've got to deal with them as and when it comes up. So it all depends. How much headache do you want? That's it. That's fact. How much headache do you want? Do you want no headache or do you want some headache? How much do you want to get involved? Because some of our clients are architects. So we're building out for them and they want to get involved from start to finish themselves or interior designers? Um, I have one question. Um, it might be um, for, for Nicholas. Um, I'm going to read it out loud, um, Nicholas. I have an architect's planning drawings uh, and a rough quote that suits my budget from a local builder based on this. In order to get my project started and comply with building control, do I then need an architect again? Or can my builder do the building details and proceed anyway? Uh, cool. So really complex question based on how difficult and complicated the building is and also the level that the drawings are at currently and the information that you currently have. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you may have a set of drawings. If they were planning level drawings, odds are they probably won't include all of the information that you would require from building control. Um, if the person has done uh, drawings that were of a suitable level to get a really good price you know, done, then there probably is a bit more information than is it. So we're looking at things like the additional information is things like insulation levels, um, details, foundation details. You will need um, structural calculations. So not just the structural, structural details, but the calculations themselves that they can take the loading and things like that. Um, fire plans to show how the fire escapes and things are gonna work for the property and to make sure that the right sprinklers and fire doors and things like that are in there. Um, that's about the bulk of it. There's a, there's a bunch of other notes uh, that you really need to include with the whole thing. So you may or may not have that information based on the drawings that you have currently. Um, the next question is, do I need an architect to come back in to do that? Again, that's going to depend on how big and complicated your project is. So some projects you can, uh, the contractor, so if we think about this in very simple terms, very small projects that don't have any architects involved at all, they, the builders will do the whole uh, building control portion of everything to themselves anyway. So 
they generally uh, just do what's called uh, build a building notice, I think is that one. And they, so basically they can just um, give notice to building control that they're going to do the work and building control come in and check through the process what's going on and make sure that everything's being designed properly. But they don't need a full plan sign off um, for everything. So if it's a fairly simple build, you can get your builder to do that whole process and then probably speak to them about whether or not they feel comfortable doing that. Um, if it's a fairly complicated one, then you might need to get them back involved, but it's not overly complicated to put a building control pack together. You know, that's a building control pack versus a full construction pack. They're different things and they're not, it's not that onerous to do. But one thing we haven't even mentioned is a CDM 2015 principal designer and principal contractor. That's a whole different ball game. Because if, you, if your builder doesn't know, doesn't comply with CDM 2015, and he doesn't know about being a principal contractor, you've got problems. And also, someone has got to be principal designer. And that principal designer, it's nothing about being a architect or interior designer. It's about being the principal designer of the health and safety pack. So all these are extra things someone has got to deal with. You know, even the even the the clients, they've got responsibilities for bringing everyone on board. It so sounds like um, that's. If you, don't, if you don't go, if you go with the architect, right, and not the, someone has got to be the principal contractor, principal designer, and the, and someone has got to take on the responsibilities of the client's responsibilities, and that is usually the contractor or someone else. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a minefield. It's a minefield. And that is going to be a topic for a future webinar. Boom. I propose. <laughs> um, we, we are wrapping up uh, because people are, uh, of course, um, they probably have some, some place else to be, but I would like to wrap up by saying thank you all for tuning in today. It was uh, a pleasure having you all here, uh, also having all the questions. And especially thank you to, uh, to Nick Jeffries from New Projects and Nicholas Hallway from uh, RD. Um, we see both of their information on the screen now. Um, and you will be able to find them also when you, uh, or if you download the webinar after the webinar. If you're still considering to include bespoke roof lights, you are more than uh, welcome to reach out to our daylight experts uh, at Barrio by Vilox. Uh, contact information is here. And also book a free consultation if you would like to have any sparring on drawings or daylight design or similar. We will stay tuned uh, for 15 minutes uh, in order to answer any question that you might have specifically for your project. So both uh, Nick, Nicholas and I will stay tuned. Uh, but thank you all uh, who do not have questions for participating during today's webinar. And stay safe out there. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Um, there's a, there are two questions, at least. One of them is, what does Vario stand for? Vario is uh, a Latin term uh, for I vary, I change, I alter, um, indicating how the bespoke nature of our products uh, alter and change according to the customer's requirements. That's the reason it is called oh, yeah. Vario by the X. Who's that? <laughs> I don't know. Was that your um, reason? <laughs> then there's another another question from uh, from Bruce. Um, Bruce is in the early stages of planning a rear extension, and some friends have talked about U value requirements placed on their developments, whilst others said it was never mentioned. What conditions do we need to meet in terms of U value? Okay, so generally that comes into play later, so not at the planning stages. Um, sometimes if you're doing a new build, but by the fact that you said that you're doing an extension, it sounds like that that's not applicable. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll condition it during the planning stages, but that's unlikely to be a consideration at this point for you. 
Um, but U values all that's all part of. So when I was talking about insulation values for the building control pack, that that's when that comes into play. Uh, and realistically, everything will have been. You don't necessarily need to consider that at build at planning stages because that information isn't important to the planners. The planners are kind of only concerned with what it looks like in the materials. Um, but that's what we that's the extra information that we then get at the building break stages. Now, the U values themselves are not overly onerous for I mean they're onerous compared to what we used to do in the 70s and 80s, but they're basically just basic modern building standards. They're they're nothing to be too scared of. Um, uh, it is also the responsibility of the builder or the designer that, that puts this together to make sure that everything complies with building rigs. So at this stage, it's not really something that you need to consider or be worried about. Um, it should be handled at the next stage, basically. Okay, I hope that uh, answers your question. Bruce, you're free to, to uh, talk if, uh, and ask additional questions to Nicholas if you want to. No, that's great. Very useful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah sorry. I hope that was that kind of covered it. Um, it did. Thank you. No problem. So um, basically each each element in the house will have its own U value, which is, as I said, it's just that's the thermal performance of each element. So every new bit that you put on, so everything from the windows to the walls, uh, the floor and the roof, they, I mean, they're the basic ones, they, they all have to have a compliant U value that you're designing the new uh, fabric of the building to. Um, one thing to really watch out for though, loads of people don't think about this is, as I just say this, is that if you um, alter an existing element, then often the, the building control people will make you upgrade that existing element to either a completely new level of building rigs or a halfway point between the two. Um, so uh, that may not sound relevant, but for instance, if you are doing loads of work to the rear extension and then you go to the front room and uh, you're, you hack off all of the plaster around the bay window and replace all of that plaster, if building control come and can catch you doing that, they will make you insulate that entire wall complete, like com the whole thing as you go back on. So the whole wall will get an extra 100 mil thick. So it's something worth considering either to add that into the design and the extra cost there, or to maybe do that at a different time. <laughs> uh, just what I'm thinking about. Thank you. And Mark, you also have a question regarding the, the, uh, the windows in particular, and the bespoke barrier products do come in both double layer and triple layer uh, paints, uh, also with a solar protection film. Um, and in relation to the U-values, um, of course, the triple layer paint significantly reduces or improves uh, the U-value of the products. Um, and whether they are easy to install, they are certainly easy to install. Uh, the biggest challenge of these products um, is to get them on the roof um, in principle. And that is uh, primarily because of the size of the products. Um, they tend to be relatively big and therefore they also weigh quite a bit. But um, Vario has a, a range of services that will help reduce the complexity um, regarding the delivery and the installation. We both offer an on roof delivery services uh, or service and also an installation uh, service if needed. And you're also free to, uh, Mark, you didn't have the, the microphone, I think. All right. Or maybe you do. You're free to talk if you, uh, if you want, and I hope that uh, that answers your question. I don't mind. All good. Um, but I hope it answers your question. Otherwise, feel free to reach out. Um, and Irina, um, you, you had a question um, regarding the small spaces and uh, we tried to take it live um, during the webinar, but potentially you would like to get um, a bit of more uh, information on it uh, or discuss it with either Nick or Nicholas. Um, 
I hope we covered it during the webinar. You at least mentioned something, Nicholas, regarding uh, seeking inspiration in Asia uh, and uh, um, what they do about small spaces. And you also mentioned that Pinterest would be a good place to start. Uh, and you mentioned the importance of uh, focusing on the fabric and the furnitures because in principle, the smaller spaces are often uh, not that complicated to build. Um, but it is really important what you put into them because it needs to work together in order not to seem super crowded and dysfunctional. That yeah. was how I understood it. Yeah, and I, I was thinking about that a bit more since I answered it. I think um, if, if any of the types of designs need to be more function follows form, yeah, yeah. Goes, they, they do it in a way you, you really need to, or rather form follows function, you, they need to be functional. You know, when, when you've got a small space, it really needs to work. Every little bit of it needs to work at all times. So, um, you know, really it needs to be driven by how you can best make use of the, the space. And, and um, I think that's what they capture really well in those micro apartments where they, where they do all of this amazing stuff. It's like, how can one space do so many things? Um, I think that's the key. Good. That was actually it, guys. Fantastic. Thank you so much, both of you, both Mr. Jeffries and uh, Holloway. You're welcome. Yeah, no problem. It was a pleasure. Uh, we'll uh, share the webinar with the two of you as well after having uh, downloaded it and potentially cropped it a bit. But thank you so much for your for your effort and your valid input. And um, appreciate. It. We're going to send out some kind of like update or something I'll, I'll chat to patricia about it but we'll let's do that let's take a chat about it yeah sounds good um lovely brilliant have a great weekend and nice to kind of meet you again nick yeah uh, and you uh have a good weekend stay yeah. safe will do yeah likewise bye 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 how do i go now <laughs> <laughs>